In this lecture, we're going to be looking at the second and third steps in the information processing process when we talk about the topics of memory and thinking. In particular, we're going to tie these particular processes into developmental psychology and look at how both skill sets develop throughout our lifespan and change with each and every step along the way. Start this lecture off by looking at the ste second step in information processing, this very important component of what we call memory. It's important to note that when looking at memory, there's a lot of different terms and concepts that are tied with this overarching idea. Memory is essentially our ability to take information that we've encountered in the past and find a way to store it inside of our heads. But there's lots of nuances to that storage process that can be studied by people interested in the topic of memory. One of the common areas that people look at with memory is this idea of something called capacity. How much information can be put into the brain for at least a short period of time. And when looking at developmental psychology, this topic of capacity is something of critical importance when looking at young children. Another thing very closely linked to capacity ideas is this concept of span. Not necessarily how much you can put into your head, but how long that information can stay in your head before it either deteriorates or becomes altered in some form. And when you put these two things together, Oftentimes, people start talking about another topic called organization, how we're able to compartmentalize the information that we're trying to keep inside of our heads and eventually recall it in a way that actually makes sense and relates the material together. This also brings us back to a topic that we discussed in our last module, this idea of schemas. Essentially, if we want to keep information in our head, we better find a way to link it up with past experiences and relatively novel ideas. This involves coming up with schemas or altering schemas, something that really is a critical component to this memory process. We want to break down memory further, more than just how long and how much we can retain in our heads. To understand subtle changes that happen in memory throughout our lifetime, we have to appreciate that many memory researchers like to break up memory and compartmentalize memory into other groupings. One of the common things that people often talk about with respect to memory is what's called the temporal stages of memory. In essence, they argue that we have potentially three different stages of memory that exist. The first stage of memory is something called sensory memory, or sometimes you'll see it listed in textbooks as the sensory store. Now, this particular type of memory is something that's very intertwined with the topic we talked about in our last class, the concept of attention. Essentially, what memory researchers argue is that sensory memory is this infinite store that's able to take in everything that we're being presented at any given moment but unless we're paying attention to all of or certain components of this, almost all of this information is lost very quickly. In fact, within a fraction of a second. So essentially, for sensory memory to really be processed, we need to incorporate that concept of attention that we talked about earlier into the formula. This is where, again, memory and attention sort of get intermingled. Most researchers don't really test sensory memory because it's really too complex and difficult to try to tackle. But the belief is, is that it's probably present pretty much at birth. It's just to get that attention working so we can actually transition sensory memory into the next stage of memory that we call short-term memory. Sometimes you'll hear it being called working memory. We need to develop some of those attention skills that we talked about in our previous lecture. But if we do develop some attention skills, that's when we start to be able to utilize the next stage, the next temporal stage of memory that we again call short-term memory, or you'll sometimes see sort of incorrectly listed in textbooks as working memory. 
I call it incorrectly listed because the person who introduced this concept of working memory, a gentleman named Alan Badley, argued that the working memory was kind of an alternative idea of sensory or short-term memory. Sorry, it incorporated lots of different components that came together to explain our day-to-day -day working well memory, how where we were able to to kind of interact with the environment that was around us. Short-term memory is more like a, a temporary repository for information. It's the information that we've theoretically decided is worth paying attention to and are mulling over as to whether or not we want to work on it further so we can then bring that memory into something that we call our long-term memory. But it's also, if we're talking about short-term memory, something that pulls up parts of our long-term memory so we can better understand and comprehend what it is we're encountering at any given moment. Essentially, short-term memory, or if we want to call it working memory, is a very complex thing that first requires us to have some attention skills, and then also requires us to, if we're going to use it effectively, develop that last stage of memory that's critical, something called long-term memory where we can have past experiences, things that we've deemed useful, that have easily pulled up if the right scenario arises. Now, when we talk about long-term memory, though, we get into a murky area where we appreciate that there's tons of distortions and schemas become really important. And essentially, if we want to test it, we know we're getting into a world where we're dealing with biased information and individualized information that is sometimes a lot more difficult to tackle in labs and tests in comparison to its counterpart, short-term memory. Well, we're going to, in this class, when talking about development, reference a number of these different stages of memory and how they start to develop at different ages in our life. In this lecture, we're going to be talking about a second way that we classify memory the difference between what's called implicit and explicit memories. If we go back to the idea of long-term memories or even short-term memories, one could argue that these memories come in two different forms. One type, which is just kind of inherent within us, which is called the mem implicit memory. Usually this deals with motor skills that we've developed or kind of what we sometimes call classically conditioned responses to different environments or different people or different stimuli. And then this other grouping that we call explicit memory, stuff that we consciously recall and provide declarative descriptions of. A classic example of explicit memory is what we call a semantic memory, where we can talk about specific facts that we've learned. But another type of explicit memory that's out there is something called episodic memory, where we can essentially provide a timestamp paired up with the knowledge or the, the factual stuff that we're able to articulate. My favorite example of these differentiations is if I say, asked you something like, who was the first person you met in college? And you could maybe give me their name, or I could ask you, what were the details of that first interaction? That's the difference between semantic memories and episodic memories. Both of them are intertwined with each other, and it's sometimes tough for memory researchers to even tease them apart. But we do like to kind of classify them slightly separately, because when looking at different things tied to memory, like development, we sometimes see differences emerge to, to kind of when they're utilized and how good we are at using them at different points in our life. all of these components of memory really relate to developmental psychology. And it's first important to start off by saying our memory when we're born is, well, what we think, probably non-existent. There's zero indications in numerous studies that children have any even basic rudimentary memories at the moment of birth. Essentially, all we are are reflexory machines. It's not until our brain starts to develop and we start to experience things and be able to process stuff with respect to attention that we think our first inklings of memories start to form. And if we're looking at the very first memories that pop up, it relates to something that we talked about earlier. 
When we discussed Piaget, we talked about these things called primary circular reactions. Infants essentially doing things to produce specific responses. One of those primary secondary uh, primary responses or so primary circular responses are often kind of just random. Right? A child does something, a result happens, so they do it again. But as time passes, the child starts to display memory, transitions to the secondary circular reactions, and they start to do things in specific environments with this intention to produce specific outcomes. There's actually a classic mobile experiment, uh, I think we call the mobile experiment, where infants had this really interesting kind of circular revolving mobile placed above them. And they had something connected to their feet that allowed them to, when they moved their feet, get the mobile to move. Just because infants tend to move on their own anyways, they oftentimes triggered the movement of this mobile through their just random spastic movements. But what researchers were able to show is that by around three, four, five months, most of these children were able to start to, to when they found themselves in environments where the mobile was present or situations where the mobile was typically present, started to display that this activity, increased activity of the foot, theoretically would trigger the actions of the mobile. Most people contend that this is the first inklings that memory is sort of there. And again, it relates to this need for attention and of desire before memory really even makes sense. And once it starts to form, it tends to really take a long time before it can really solidify. Most research suggests that it's not until about six months that a child can remember some fact or something that they've done for a day. This means that essentially children are pretty much blank slates when it comes to memory for a large portion of the first year of their life. But oddly enough, by the time they reach about two, their memory suddenly becomes very strong. And this is usually traced back to the growth in not only attention skills, but the growth in the area most often linked to memory in the brain, a structure called the hippocampus. But even though by the time we're two years old, we can sometimes retain really important information for almost a year and essentially start to talk about long-term memory really sort of being there, what we see is this long-term memory in two and three-year-olds is extremely fleeting. In fact, it's led to the introduction of a term that's sometimes debated amongst many people, a concept called infantile amnesia where most researchers looking at memory in infants have gone on to contend that almost everybody in the world has no recollection of anything that happened to them, no matter how important it was, in the first three years of their lives. I know many of you probably disagree with this statement. You can argue that you know somebody who swears they remember their birth or swears they remember their second birthday. But most researchers have contended that those that swear they remember those things are either remembering something that they were told about, or they just have some random fleeting collection of memories that they somehow have associated with, say, a first or second birthday. It's still, though, not necessarily safe to say that these people don't really remember those things. It's just we haven't had an abundant amount of research evidence to prove or suggest that it's really possible for most people. In fact, most people argue that not only do we need attention to really have those good long-term memory stores, but we need to really start to develop some sound schemas. We have to have some pretty good language skills, and we have to have further development of structures of the brain, like the frontal lobe and hippocampus. The frontal lobe being related to planning and organization and the hippocampus being tied to memory before we're really able to have what we would truly call long-term memories. Before then, it's pretty much just fleeting implicit memories that dominate the lives of many infants up to a year and then fleeting combinations of implicit and explicit memories that dominate the lives of children from about a year to three years of age.
we reach about three years of age, we do start to see a dramatic increase in both the short-term and long-term memory of children. One of my favorite examples of how much our memory increases within a few years is when children are given these things called digit span tasks, where they're read a list of numbers and asked to repeat that list of numbers back in sequential order. If you do this test with a two-year-old, even if they can repeat the numbers back to you, usually they cap out at about two to three words. Very few two-year-olds can retain four sorry, not words, numbers, spans of numbers in their heads. Yet oddly enough, by the time they reach four, this task is fairly doable. And by the time they double in age from four to eight, they've almost increased their span about two more numbers. It might not seem like much, but the ability to store just those few extra items in your head for a short period of time allows for much greater understanding of things, the ability to tie in past information to new experiences, and it really explains how not only thinking becomes more complex by the time we get into our later childhood years, but our ability to tie things together gets better as we progress into the latter stages of childhood. We also see is that long-term memory really does start to take shape. So for the very first time, children don't have to just tackle every topic anew. They can pull in past experiences to be able to really grapple with those things. It's important to note here that this is not something that just magically happens overnight. So it's not that a child has no long-term memory at two and then poof, magically at two and a half, they suddenly have a fully developed long-term memory. But it's still a gradual growth process, but it's starting to happen during childhood. And this also means if we're looking at kind of the growth in memory of children, that <laughs> the tying in of past information, the growth and how much we can pick up, is to lead into a lot of confidence in memory skills of children. This is good to an extent, but it can lead to some problems because even though kids' memories are improving, they are very susceptible to alterations one of the things that's often talked about with young kids at around age three or four is how impactful false memories can be in their understandings of the world. Essentially, just through sheer suggestion, many kids can have vivid recollections of events or experiences that didn't actually happen. And when children are asked to just remember details of their own, what you often find is, like we talked about with attention, memories of things are kind of scattershot. They'll remember events from, say, a movie or a story, but what they remember oftentimes does seem random. And this is both a byproduct of a developing memory system and those issues with attention that we talked about in the last lecture. It also, theoretically, is something tied to language. And this concept of how we learn to tell stories as we progress from infancy into childhood and then adolescence. Essentially, what I want you to get from this is that in childhood, we're finally able to start to develop some of the memory skills that are essential for us to be able to process the world around us. But those memory skills are really just developing. They're just starting to take shape and because of it, they're extremely malleable and somewhat questionable at about this age. Past childhood, what we see is our memory tends to kind of peak out in adolescence and really stay there for the vast majority of our life. In fact, our memory, what we call our working or short-term memory, if anything, it's just slightly improving a little bit each and every year until our mid 40s. Then at age 40, 45, our memory, our overall memory, starts to take a small, subtle dip. But that small, subtle dip is almost non existent for one particular type of memory that we talked about earlier. This type of memory that we call semantic memory memories of facts and details. What most researchers have contended when we run not the cross-sectional studies, but longitudinal studies with groups, 
is that semantic memories tend to stay very solid in the heads of individuals all the way until the 80s and 90s of most of these people. And it's oftentimes not something that declines until there's some biological or environmental precursor to the decline in semantic memories. Essentially, that means that you're going to be able to retain a lot of facts in your head. When we're talking about the aggregate of facts that you're able to retain, you're going to be able to retain more and more facts throughout your entire life. But it doesn't mean that all memory stays pristine throughout your entire life. Semantic memories can be tweaked to an extent. More importantly, our ability to recall specific events starts to hinder, or I guess drop, once we get past our mid-40s. Now, most research suggests that our overall number of episodic memories retained in our head doesn't dramatically drop when we get into our 50s, 60s, and beyond. But peculiarly, what we find is that many specific events that people recall tend to be much more focused on our younger ages. So people in their 60s and 70s might struggle to remember something that happened to them just a few months ago, but they might have a clear recollection of something that happened, say, in their mid-30s. And this might be a byproduct of society. It might be a byproduct of the lives of these individuals, but many researchers have argued that it's actually more a byproduct of the first inklings of decline of memory, where it's just harder to store new episodic memories in the head than it was before, even if some of the past ones that we have don't deteriorate. And, and it causes these weird effects where there's been numerous studies to show that people in their 80s, 90s, and beyond struggle to remember just the, the last couple years of their lives and even relate specific events to themselves that just recently happened, yet they can still vividly recall past effects. My favorite example of this is if you go into nursing homes or elderly homes, what you often see is many people in these homes have their images put on the doors for them to help give them a reminder or a prompt that the door is to their room. But very often when you look at the pictures, you won't see current pictures of them. What you'll see is pictures of them from 30, 40, 50 years ago because those pictures are much easier to identify for these individuals than the current images of what they actually look like. Now, I understand that there's other factors at play, but it sort of brings home how much we do see a decline in episodic memory, specific episodic memories of our latter years, even if our memory facilities are intact all the way into the point where we start to have some type of degenerative cause that causes this shift down in our memory capacity. If we're looking at declines in memory, though, it's not just overall memory that does start to trickle away in our latter years. What we tend to see when people do get tested with their memories in their latter years is that even though the capacity isn't really shrinking that much, the speed at which specific memories are recalled and the range of memories that are recalled do start to decrease. This tends to lead to, as people in their latter years, tending to tell the same story over and over again and tending to struggle and slowly pull up information as they're doing it. It's not that the memories aren't there, it's just, well, we start to go down much more commonly traveled paths, and we start to take a little bit longer to go down those paths as we get into the latter years of our lives. We also struggle with specific components of memory that we often don't struggle with in our younger years. One of the things that many people discuss when talking about the elderly is this idea of something called source memory, where we remember a specific thing that happened, but not maybe where that thing happened or who that thing happened with. Essentially, we get the gist of the story, but the details, the fine nuances, the context, those things can be much more easily forgotten. 
Another thing that tends to be linked to episodic memory that gets forgotten for elderly individuals is this idea of something called perspective memory, where we remember to do certain things on a regular basis. Essentially, we really struggle in our latter years with being able to maintain things like daily or weekly routines. This is something that can be really problematic for people who, say, have pets that need to be fed every day, or pills that need to be taken every day, or things that need to be happening for these individuals on a weekly basis. And to mitigate these problems, there's usually a lot of encouragement for people who do get into the latter years of their lives to have some type of system device that helps them essentially jog their memory to do lots of these daily or weekly or monthly tasks. In fact, there's a booming market right now for many individuals trying to find ways to help with these kind of slight subtle memory declines in the elderly that are sometimes overlooked. This is going to be a point here where we're going to transition away from the topic of memory to something that's very closely linked to it and attention. The last stage in information processing that we call thinking. And when we talk about thinking, there's lots of different ways that we can go. We're going to tie thinking into development. There's two common areas that people explore. The first type of thinking that's explored is this idea of something called critical thinking. Ability to process stuff and create some type of deeper meaning from the information that we're being given. If we're looking for the emergence of critical thinking skills, oftentimes researchers look on people's ability to apply what they've discovered in the past to a new situation and to link up ideas or concepts that have some type of relationship with each other in a coherent way. If we're talking about critical thinking in these two ways, what we tend to see is that usually the development of critical thinking continues to increase almost throughout our entire lifespan instead until some type of degenerative issue starts to take place. There is a caveat to this, though, when we talk about critical thinking, and this is going to be something that we're going to revisit over and over again when we talk about this last section, and that's the fact that there are lots of individual differences when we talk about the development of critical thinking. Some people peak in their critical thinking skills in their 60s and 70s. Others peak in their critical thinking skills in their teenage years. There's a huge range of not only when people peak in their critical thinking skills, but also what their peak actually is. And it makes it really challenging for researchers to have charts like we've seen in memory and attention, because there is such a wide range of variability on this particular topic. Another thing that's closely related to thinking skills is this, again, idea of something called categorization, where we're able to find ways to put things into different groupings so we can better understand the world around us. This goes back to the idea of schemas. And what we see is that we do start to develop categorization skills at a young age, but it continues to increase it. Oddly enough, it shifts also as we progress. To understand the importance of categorization, that we do something a little different. appreciate how children think differently from adults in terms of categorization, I thought I'd have you spend a minute or two trying to separate out this collection of items into four separate groups. To do this, you're going to have to pause, and if you're done, please advance to the next slide. We'll talk about what you did, or at least what you likely did, when performing this task. Now, my guess is that when you did that categorization, you did a number of things that were substantially different from young children. And to understand these differences, we can talk about another really key element to categorization, something called problem solving. Problem solving is essentially our ability 
to when we encounter new things, find ways to, to kind of categorize the problems, overcome them, and to come up with a solution that makes sense. And much like categorization, problem solving is something that forms as we're advancing from infancy into childhood and adolescence and beyond. But it's something that even as it's developing, we notice stark differences between the way children do these things and adults do these things. Now, going back to those categorization tasks that you had before, my guess is that most of you, if we look at your categories, had fairly balanced sized categories. And the categories that you created were across kind of consistent themes. So maybe you based it on the colors of objects or what you do with certain objects or what the objects are made of. Very rarely do adults say, okay, I'm gonna have one category of things that are brown, one category of things that I write with, and one category of things that are you know, shaped in this way, but because that doesn't really fit our framework for how you should set up categories. We've essentially learned by adulthood that we should have kind of a universal way of separating out categories and then figure out which categories we want to create. Kids don't often abide by those rules. They tend to use random disparate ones and they don't worry if certain items are in multiple categories or that the category sizes are equally large. It just doesn't even come to mind that they should think about those things when working on categories. The same thing works when it comes to problem solving. Children obviously aren't as good as adults in terms of problem solving overall. Sometimes the way they tackle problems can lead them to really interesting results that are maybe even sometimes on occasion more correct than the way adults can get to these things. And this is because oftentimes when children encounter problems, like the matchstick problem you see in front of you where you're supposed to just add one match to each of those to figure out a way to make those three equations work, I promise you can try it a little bit later if you haven't, or the, the classic candle problem where you're asked to figure out a way to take a box of tacks, a candle, and a matchstick box and, and create out of this, actually a matchstick packet out of this, a, a, a wonderful candle that you could light in a room without spilling everywhere. These types of tasks, these types of problems that people are given tend to be approached in a way with children where they just kind of haphazardly try to come up with a solution and oftentimes do come up with a solution to these problems, but it takes them a long time to do it. And what they've learned from the previous problem doesn't often carry over to the next one. So if you've learned that changing a minus into a plus sign or you know changing a number it, just a little bit has solved a previous problem, so don't take that information with them and the match to stick problem that you see in front of you and try to apply it to the next one. It means that if there is some repetition, they're gonna struggle with that. Classic example of this issue is when you try to do math problems with young kids or even reading challenges with young kids. And you'd think after repetitive experiences with the routine that they'd get faster and better at each and every time they do it. But it's not quite that simple with lots of children. It usually doesn't just require a few exposures before a child really tackles a problem easily. It requires a multitude of exposures before they're able to kind of jump into a system and recognize it. Whereas adults sometimes jump into systems too fast. Like say for the first one, if you learn that you just have to change the three into a different number and suddenly boom, you've got your answer. And moving down to the second one starts to sometimes become more challenging for adults because they start looking for how they can shift numbers into different numbers to make that formula in the middle line work. Completely missing, there's a very simple way to make that formula work if you start messing with the equation itself. This relates to an idea that we often call functional fixedness with adults. 
that the tendency for once an adult figures out a way to solve one problem, of have them use that solution over and over and over again. Now, it can be beneficial if the problem is very closely related and the solution to the first problem is the same as the solution to the second problem. But it can become problematic if things shift like we just talked about. And it can become even more problematic if we're trying to answer problems with a solution that's not the best one. This is something that's often been cited in looking at problem solving skills and organization skills when we look at adolescence. They start to essentially develop this functional fixedness in adolescence, but their approach to problems is still kind of haphazard like it is for children. And essentially what you can get is people coming up with really bad solutions that they're using over and over again to a multitude of problems when they reach their teenage years. Obviously, there's other things that are involved in that, but it is kind of a big issue with lots of adolescents as we transition from just kind of haphazardly tackling problems or trying to categorize things into a more organized way that can unfortunately sometimes lead us down the wrong path or into a rut that's tough to come out of. Note here that even though functional fixedness is real, it can happen when we talk about aging and thinking, that last step in information processing. Most research has suggested that as we get older, we don't see much of a decline in our thinking skills. In fact, most people talk for the very first time in this entire class about how getting older and older has more and more benefits when it comes to this particular process. This is related to something that we often call in cognitive psych circles expertise. Now, I know that we have our lay definition of expertise as being related to just kind of having a lot of experience in something, but if we're looking at expertise in the cognitive field, it's more about having a knowledge base having an understanding of the interconnectedness of different nuances to a specific topic. When we have greater expertise in a topic, it helps us avoid some of the functional fixedness that we talked about earlier, and it helps increase our skills in what we call decision making. What we essentially see in numerous studies is that if somebody's doing something that relates to something that they're knowledgeable about, the older we get, the better we are at making decisions. Now, there are lots of caveats to this. One being, look, if our health starts to decline or our stimulation or education level starts to decline, then the decision making that we make isn't inherently going to get significantly better. And if we go beyond the scope of what we know, our decision making when we get older is not any better than it was when we were younger. If we are focusing on something that we are experts in, or at least very knowledgeable in, then our decision making doesn't ever really seem to decline, even if it takes us a little bit longer to decide on things when we get into the much latter years of our lives. It's also important to highlight again here that there are huge individual differences in terms of how much expertise people have, what types of expertise they have, and how this translates to better decision-making across a wide variety of different problems that we might encounter. Great degree of variability from person to person is a great place to kind of end with this particular module. Because in the next module, we're going to go beyond just talking about who's a good decision-maker and who's not. Instead, talk about topic that's really intertwined with cognitive psychology, an area of intense debate and research over the years called intelligence. Now we're going to spend a little bit of time talking about how intelligence and developmental psychology have been intertwined for decades, but after looking at the overlap between theorists and concepts that relate to intelligence and developmental psych, we'll start tackling different nuances to intelligence, different you know, individual skills that people possess, and how those individual skills that we tend to link to intelligence 
can be ticked up or down at different ages in life. We know it's a little bit tougher to tie intelligence directly to development like we've done with some of these things because theoretically intelligence is a lot about mental comparisons, but I promise when you come back on that next module, you'll see that we do have lots of different ways that we can tie this very critical and also highly sensitive topic of intelligence to this area of developmental psych. Until then, enjoy your days, and I hope to see you soon. Take care.